and welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today on the show, we have Alex Connolly. He's an internal medicine physician, and he wrote the Kevin MD article, A Los Angeles Response to the Pandemic. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, so we'll get into your article in a little bit, but mm -hmm. I was wondering first if you could share your story and your journey to where you are today. Of course. So I started out working as uh, uh, working with the uh, AMR, which is a ambulance company here in LA County area, San Bernardino County area in California, and that was kind of the beginning of my first interest in medicine. So that was my first exposure, being out in the field, um, and was kind of my springboard for going into medical training. And uh, you know, I'm working in internal medicine now, but I was trying to decide between internal medicine and emergency medicine, and I had uh, really good experiences through medical school within emergency medicine. And one thing that really stuck with me that I, that I really enjoyed learning uh, about concepts of was disaster medicine and the concept of triage. And, um, you know, moving forward through, you know, to, to where I am now as an attending, that concept seems to be coming to the forefront again. You know, I'm working as an academic hospitalist and I'm seeing uh, many of these patients in the hospital who are coming in with COVID. And one thing that we saw in uh, Italy was that resources became overwhelmed fairly quickly at the start of the pandemic and nobody really understood the disease. Um, nobody really was ready to take on the, the burden of ventilator support that was needed up front. And that was something that we were worried about for the United States when things started out on the East Coast um, and then migrated to the West Coast. And uh, I, I think with some of the lead time that we've had in Los Angeles, we didn't feel quite full brunt of that force. So, so my involvement in the past couple of months has, has really been not as bad as I thought it would be, just because the uh, because I think we had a little bit of time to prepare. As I said, I think that lead time has helped us out quite a bit. But the, the article that I wrote about, just to kind of give a little bit of detail about it, is uh, about what, what systems we have in case our resources were to become overwhelmed. What would we do if, if uh, specifically with COVID-19 pandemic, what would we be able to do if there was such a widespread burden of disease that our ICU, their intensive care units were becoming overwhelmed or that our capacity was being reached or if there weren't enough ventilators available or intraortic balloon pumps or CRT, uh, a renal replacement therapy for uh, patients in renal failure. And, um, and some, of the, some of the thinking from this, it really made me think back to my uh, EMS days and my, you know, what I'd learned in, in, about emergency medicine in medical school because that's where I, I, for, I was really exposed to this concept of triage. And I, I think there's some analogs to uh, between the triage system that's used in the field and in emergency medicine and what we potentially would have to deal with uh, with the re-emerging COVID pandemic. And so what I'm referring to by that for people who aren't familiar with it, in emergency medicine, there's, there's a tag system that's used. Uh, whenever you're in a situation where essentially your local resources are overwhelmed by whatever disruption is happening or whatever hazard is affecting the community or the region, and that can be in the form of you know, earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, terrorist attacks, or widespread illness. And, and this is also a, you know, a, a battle concept as well. And so the way that this works is there are different colors that are attributed to different patients. Uh, when you, uh, let's say there, were, there was a mass casualty event and you have first responders, police, paramedics all coming out to the scene, you need to be able to quickly determine who can you help and who can wait for help, who needs immediate help, and who might not benefit from those resources. And the way that you can go about doing that is a tagging system with a red tag being a level one for these, for these people where they're in immediate danger, they need immediate treatment, but there's, but, but there's, some, there's uh, some hope that you are going to be able to get them better. Yellow is uh, essentially, they're, they're really not doing well, but they're not in immediate danger. Green is kind of like you're you know, somebody walking around after a building collapse, but their arm got scraped up and uh, they're otherwise doing well. And a black tag is if they're expecting, if, you, if, you, if they are either deceased or their injuries are so severe that even if you were to immediately treat them, you don't expect them to move forward with their survival. 
And so the reason that I think this ties into things that we need to think about for the COVID pandemic are essentially exemplified by what we saw in Europe. We saw a country being completely overwhelmed and resources being overwhelmed and the country being devastated in the process. When I originally wrote this article, I wrote it and submitted it and started seeing the numbers decline and I was relieved. I was happy that it felt like my article was gonna be completely irrelevant. But now we're starting to see those numbers change a bit. You know, we, we went from seeing kind of an early April for, um, for the area peak cases in the 33,000 cases per day for us. And, and our numbers started dwindling down since then overall for the country. Um, but on June 23rd, we finally got back to that peak level. And as of yesterday, actually, we're, we've almost doubled that case number, for that daily case load um, up at 57,000 cases. And what does this mean globally? This is translated into you know, a little over half a million deaths. And this is based off of the data that we know, right? This is based right. off of as best as we can determine that those that number of deaths has been attributable to COVID. There may be more, there may be less, but you know that's that's the number that we're working. What I'm right, what I wrote about in the article is if we do end up in a uh, a resource shortage situation, how do we go about allocating resources? And so it kind of brings us back to this concept of triage, in the sense that there will be people who um, are doing well who don't necessarily need. Um, additional re- additional resources. Um, they're kind of like the the, the walking well, as we'll, we'll we'll call them. On the other side of the spectrum, we may have we'll have other individuals who have multiple medical comorbidities, who may have end stage renal disease, who may have liver disease, heart failure, who have other forms of in organ dysfunction, um, and this may decrease their overall probability of survival. And with that being known, if we were to be in a situation where we have a certain number of ventilators for a certain number of people and the number of people that need them exceed what we have, that we may have to utilize that form of a triage concept. Not just uh, not speaking specifically to the hospitals within I, which I work, but for the county, for the country, for other cities that may be more burdened. You know, we have certain regions that are more burdened than others, and there may be different societal factors play, playing a role in that. I think what that ultimately means is that there should be some familiarity with these concepts among uh, you know, major regional hospitals for different areas um, in, case that needs to, in case that needs to be used. Um, it, it seemed like that might not be as worrisome before, but now to see the transition in the numbers that we have in such a short time frame, just in this past you know, eight, seven to 10 days, as well as seeing how much congregation has been happening in the public. I think it's really bringing this type of issue and this type of concept back into the spotlight. Um, and the better that the better we understand it, the better that hospitals can start to develop systems for preparing in this manner, for discussing with emergency medicine colleagues, with the ICU, figuring out how can you uh, accumulate additional resources to try to offset some of that burden as much as possible, and shuff, you know shuttling resources to the areas that would most benefit from them. I'm by no means an expert on this topic, but uh, I, what I should have mentioned at the beginning is that my interest in this came from the development of uh, you know resource allocation committee within our hospital, and so so this was kind of like a new concept for me. But it does seem to make sense if if you have limited resources and we we have to make a decision between who's going to benefit from those resources. We do want, ultimately want to make sure that you're providing limited ventil- limited number of ventilators to people who are most likely to survive with that ventilator support, uh, because it's unfortunate that there's many people who end up on the vent and uh, pass away and sometimes it can be after weeks and weeks of care and and if we're in a situation where resources are burdened if there's a way of distinguishing who those patients might end up being who are less likely to survive then that may overall help us from kind of like a a population viewpoint hopefully hopefully we don't get to that point hopefully we're able to mitigate those numbers you know there's always changes being made from higher up with respect to um, you know local policies to try to stem the tide again now that we're seeing this reemerge. But uh, again, there's, there's gonna be a little bit of a delay and anytime, we, and anytime we make a change, we're gonna have a delay in what we see within the community in terms of emergence of disease. Anytime we make a change to try to stem that tide again, we're gonna see a delay because cases are already blooming. 
So I think that's the point that we're at right now. I think we need to see what's the tra trajectory of the, the current expansion of, of the virus um, mm -hmm. at this point in time, see how, how else we can stem the tide. And, and really, ultimately, the main thing for us to do, I think, at this point with the numbers that we see now is to really reinforce stay-at-home orders, really keeping your, if unless there's essential reasons to go out, staying at home, really good personal hygiene, continuing social distancing, wearing masks. I'm not wearing my mask right now while I'm here inside, but I'm definitely wearing it whenever I'm outside the door. And, um, and protecting populations that are at risk. And if, so if you have elderly in the family, trying to avoid seeing them, and uh, little ones in the family, anybody who might be immunocompromised, transplant patients, all the people who tend to be at higher risk from, for, for burden of disease from coronavirus, just being mindful of, of who those people are and protecting as much as you can. Let's talk about who allocates those scarce resources. So we've ever got to a point where we do have to allocate things like ventilators. Who are the people that comprise that committee who makes those decisions? Right, so this committee is um, at, at least with, within our institution, it comprises a number of different in individuals. It has people like myself who, uh, are coming out, um, com coming in from personal interest. You know, I, I have rotate among uh, among other hospitalists within the group in terms of managing the floor hospital floor COVID uh, patient population, and um, so that's that's kind of where our role plugs in. But we also have our critical care faculty. We have administration administrative personnel for the hospital. We have nurses involved, case managers, social workers, and also a palliative care team. And, and we also involve personnel from our ethics committees as well for being able to um, help guide what that may look like. And again, this is not, has not been something that we've had to formally implement. And it, it seems like we've been able to uh, manage everything that's in front of us at this time. Um, so there's there's no scares there right now. It's more sure. of a, more of kind of like in a preparatory phase, just in case. Sure. And hypothetically speaking, if the committee makes a decision that the attending may not agree with, is there any recourse to appeal those type of decisions? Right. There is an appeals process, and um, it's it's delineated. Obviously, since we haven't ha been in a situation of needing to exercise these tools yet, we haven't we haven't been able to fully explore what that looks like and um, you know anytime you have a new process until you truly kind of go through all the steps of the process you you learn how you have, how you have to modify it and adjust it but the, there is a process for re for bring, bringing a case back up and having it reviewed by alter you know by alternative individuals outside you know from outside of that particular group who are kind of, again not associated with that patient's direct care to be able, and and that's one other thing I forgot to mention earlier that in that type of decision making the the clinician who is involved in patient care uh, for in this situation uh, is generally left out of that decision making process and that kind of that allows a little bit more impartiality to this mm -hmm. uh, and I think it also takes away uh, some of the burden of what that type of decision could carry for people who have to be involved in it on the front line of care. So, um, so to answer your question, yes, there's a process for it. Um, I, I think all the right in individuals are, are there. There's an appeals process in, in case there are disagreements, especially from family, because it's a hard thing for, you know, it, it's a hard thing for um, if you were to be in that situation mm -hmm. and you have your, you have your elderly loved one who has multiple medical comorbidities. And if sure. you have two people and you're trying to decide on a single ventilator, you know, it, it, it's hard to be involved in a decision that might not, that might not provide the support for your loved one. But we, but there are systems in place for being able to address that. Sure. We're talking to Alex Connolly. He's an internal medicine physician. He wrote the Kevin MD article, a Los Angeles response to the pandemic. Alex, what's one thing that you know now that you wish you knew back before the pandemic started? Well, I think the, the, the thing that I wish I knew now, starting, just to answer your question a little differently, it's kind of shortly after the pandemic started, was what to expect moving forward. I think I didn't realize how much of, uh, you know, the concept of social distancing and how much that impacted the spread of disease. You know, this is, uh, you know I'm a fairly junior attending and uh, don't have very much exposure uh, within medicine prior to, you know, these past two years. And, um, you know, haven't been around for, for seeing very many explosions of disease in the community and um, seeing, seeing, the, seeing the way that different social determinants, different social factors can impact the spread of a disease. I, I think I didn't really 
truly see what weight that could carry, what impact that could carry, especially with the changes that we've seen over the past week. Because essentially thinking back, like I said, I almost had, I basically had a false reassurance after writing this article, thinking that things seem to be getting better and not really noticing that, you know, actually this, this is just kind of the calm before the storm now that we've kind of allowed pockets of virus throughout the community and then sure. suddenly let the dogs back out of the bin. Uh, that mm -hmm. might not be the best terminology, but you know what I mean. You, you finally uh, set everybody loose uh, as a community. It, it's like a ticking time bomb. So. Sure. And my final question, what's your take home message for the Kevin MD audience? My take home message is continue social distancing, continue personal hygiene, stay at home and uh, you know, protect those around you. Be very cognizant of the fact that you know, this, this virus, I, I, I like the analogy that I recently heard about doing crafts projects with glitter, that if you have 10 mm -hmm. people at a table and one person's doing a project involving glitter, how many projects have glitter in them? And um, I, I think that's the way we truly need to think about this virus. It, it's, you know, it's, it's so widespread in the community right now. We, we have to take this more seriously than we ever have before. Sure. Alex, thank you so much for sharing your insight and thank you for being on the show. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for your time.